In the book of Hosea, Hosea says to us in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says, my, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because they, thou hast rejected knowledge. And so there's a couple of things here. There's one thing to lack knowledge. It's another thing to hear it and reject it. And I've spent a lot of my ministry life around people who had knowledge but did nothing with it and who had the access to the knowledge but rejected it. Many that we've been trying to communicate with over the course of these last few weeks, thank you, Brother David, have had to struggle with the issue of if Jehovah says that, Yeshua says that we can do the things that he did, why aren't we doing that? Either we don't believe it or we don't know how. And I found that many people, including myself at times, just didn't believe it at times not seeing it and not knowing how to do it and therefore not doing it. It is easy to get comfortable in having the knowledge but not doing anything with the knowledge because after all, knowledge is power and as long as I've got the information, I'm okay. But the Almighty is not satisfied with us having the information. He wants us to do something with it because faith without works is, is really dead. You can have all the knowledge and have all the information and have the right knowledge, the right information, but never apply that knowledge. And then there's this truth that we become intimate with that make us free. In other words, this truth that we take and we apply this truth. When we begin to apply this truth, we begin to see the manifestation that Father expects and desires for us to see, which in turn encourages us in our walk. Because the more you see Father backing you up, the more courage you see, the more courage you have that he will back you up. The more you believe that he will be there for you and that when you call upon him, he's going to manifest himself on your behalf. But you have to be aware that he is always there and ready to manifest himself. With this understanding, it's being mindful no matter where you are, he is right there with you. No matter where you are, he is right there with you. Hosea says that the people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's one. And then second, because they have it, but they reject it. You see, no matter how much teaching we do on manifesting the gift of healing, the question is, is what are you going to do with the teaching? That's the real question. Do you gain more information that you can add to your database, notes that you can add to your library of notes, or do you take what you're hearing and you begin to walk in it and try to the best of your ability to apply it? In 1 Peter, I want us to, to go there real quickly. 1 Peter chapter 2. And it would be good for you to read 1 Peter chapter 2. You can read it in its entirety. But for the sake of our teaching tonight, we're going to be um, dealing with 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through 25. But I'm going to jump down to verse number 18, and you can read verse 11 up to 18 on your own. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward Jehovah endures grief, suffering wrongfully. 
For what renown is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, take it patiently. This is acceptable with Jehovah. For even unto where you called, because the Messiah also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And this is the, the verse that I want us to focus on, actually the next two verses. It says, who, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed that being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, Peter is sharing with us, and he goes into some detail in this second chapter of, of, of First Peter, dealing with the whole issue of submitting and subjecting ourselves to the authorities. This is not just spiritual authorities, but also to the powers that be the worldly authorities that Paul seemed to relate to or communicate in, in some of his writings, and specifically in Romans chapter number 13. Peter is saying to us that, listen, you know, you have bosses, you have people that are over you. There are people who are going to mistreat you. There are people who are going to say things and do things to you that you don't like. And you need to understand that as a follower of Messiah who has been an example for us, that there are people who are going to treat us in a way that our natural man is not going to like. And many of these individuals who will treat us in such a way, we in the natural realm, have every right to respond to them. But taking on the form of Messiah, that now we have to be careful and understand that even though people will mistreat us as a kingdom-minded individual and a kingdom representative, remember how Yeshua endured the same thing, and he was an example. But then Peter points us to a passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, at the end when he says, <clears throat> or <clears throat> in this particular passage, he says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead, to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. Now, Peter is bringing Isaiah into the conversation. And, and that's where I want to pick up here is in Isaiah as we're talking about manifesting the gift of healing and looking at Hosea when he talks about ignorance and the lack of knowledge and how people are destroyed because of the, of the lack of knowledge, but also because when knowledge comes, they reject it. Now, I know that the, many of you who are joining with us, you believe the things that you're hearing. And, and I'm trying to put them in a, in a way as we're looking at Scripture and sharing with you Scripture, not Arthur Bailey's opinion, not some denominational doctrine, but what the Bible is actually teaching as we started out talking about Yeshua saying that we can do these things. And now it's a matter of getting busy and about his business. In Isaiah chapter number 53 is where we're going to go. And then I also, as we're, as we're speaking on this, because what I'm about to hit now 
is the whole spirit of unbelief. Remember, we've been talking about unbelieving believers. There are believers who believe in God, but don't believe what he says. There are believers who say they believe in Messiah, but don't believe what Messiah says. And part of this is people who believe in Messiah, but don't believe what he says when he says that the works that he did, we shall do, and greater works shall we do. There's an issue that we have to deal with, and this issue deals with unbelief on its deepest level. Because unbelief is a very subtle spirit. It's a very subtle spirit. There is the spirit of unbelief, ladies and gentlemen. And what's interesting is that many believers suffer from this illness <laughs> because it is a spirit no different than, than, than any physical illness. It is also a illness, if you would, a sickness, a disease that is spiritual. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says, who has believed? Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of Jehovah revealed? For he, now he's, he's, he's sharing with us this, this he who Peter is referring to, whose stripes brought us our deliverance. It brought us our healing. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. Now, when Isaiah wrote this, I don't believe, I don't know, if Isaiah could literally see the manifestation in spirit of what he's writing. Because Yeshua was not only despised and rejected, but he was treated, like, treated worse. He was treated worse than the criminals that, who, that, that, that hung beside him. You see, these individuals weren't flogged. They weren't beaten. They weren't ridiculed like Yeshua was. Of all the criminals that were hanging up on that, those, those stakes, I would dare say that Yeshua was the bloodiest. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he was marred more than any man. He was beaten to a, to a point to where it, it, it indicates that his own family would not have recognized him. He was marred more than any man. Any person in history who'd probably been beaten, Yeshua was beaten the worst. And the Bible says he has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now, the prophet is writing this hundreds of years before this dreadful event takes place back in the gospel account. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Elohim, and afflicted. Now, what Isaiah is trying to point out to us is that there is absolutely nothing you and I will ever experience that Yeshua has not already paid for. Nothing. There is no excuse worthy enough to disqualify you from the power and the manifestation of the glory of Jehovah in your body. There is absolutely nothing. It doesn't matter. If you were the one who afflicted yourself, if you were the one who caused 
all of the things that have happened in your life to come upon you, if you are the responsible party for everything that you are going through, have ever experienced, all of the grief, all of the pain, all of the shame, everything that you are going through right now, if you brought it on yourself, it does not disqualify you from what Yeshua experienced on your behalf. He was wounded. And, and this really gets to the heart of it. He was wounded for our transgression. You see, the whole idea of, of the feast and, and Yom Kippur and the, the sacrifices and all of the offerings, all of the sacrifices that, that were made on behalf of the people of Jehovah, all of these things was for the transgressions of man, for your transgression, for your iniquity, for your sins, for your lawlessness, and for mine. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. Whenever I'm going through a low point. That's the time to get alone and to give praise and to give thanks for the Almighty because there is nothing I nor you can ever experience that would even come close to what he experienced on our behalf. Absolutely nothing. It is hard sometimes for me to, to think of, and I was there. I was, I was at a place where, you know, I just wanted to take my own life. I mean, you know, it's like everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong. Everything that could possibly happen seemingly has happened. You've come to the, to the worst place, a place that is unimaginable, a place where it's hopeless, a place where you cannot see your way out. Imagine and, and, and again, I, I've been there and I'm so thankful that I didn't follow through because at that moment when things looked hopeless, I couldn't see this moment. All I could see was, was the hopelessness of the moment. I remember hearing a, a message and you know, I've heard messages over the course of my life, but there are phrases from these messages that have stuck with me. And one of these messages that I heard, and I've, I've, I've quoted this phrase many times, the difference a day makes. The difference a day makes. Today may be the worst day of your life, but if you can just get past today, this is why I believe the psalmist says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And then I've heard people say, yeah, well, I've gone to bed and I've woke up in the same condition. And I've gone to bed several times and I've woke up in the same condition and, and it hasn't made a difference. And I say to you, just keep going to bed and waking up. <laughs> just keep going to bed and waking up. Don't, don't check out. Just keep going to bed and waking up. And there will be a day when the sun shines. There will be a day when a change comes. There will be a day when your change comes, when your deliverance comes. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. For me, I believe every day there's a possibility for that day to be the day. That this is the day Jehovah has made. Now you have to make a point to rejoice and be glad in it. And as I've been sharing over and over, and I'll keep sharing every day when I wake up, the first words that come out of my mouth, this is the day Jehovah has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to let my circumstances take me out. I'm not going to let my circumstances dictate to me what kind of day I'm going to have. I'm not going to let what I'm going through cloud or put a, a cloud over the possibilities of what the Almighty can do. You know that whatever you focus on, that's where your energy goes, 
That's where your praise, when you focus on your problem, then you're putting your energy toward that. You're putting your, your, your focus toward that. When you're focusing on your problems, you can't see your problems become bigger than the God you claim to serve. He is bigger than any problem you will ever experience. It doesn't matter what you're going through, what what you've been through, what you see coming. He is bigger than any problem, any circumstance, any issue you will ever face. Our God is awesome. Jehovah is the only wise Elohim. There is none beside him. Think about it. If he created everything in the earth, then even your problem can't stand next to him and look any form or shape of any size because he's bigger than any problem you will ever experience. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. Now, you've heard of the name it and claim it, people. And we know that they've named some things and claimed some things that, you know, is certainly suspect. You can't covet your neighbor's stuff. You can't go lay hands on your neighbor's house and your neighbor's car and your neighbor's wife (laughs) or your neighbor's animals. The father who gave them that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you or I ask or even imagine. The thing is, as the the prophet starts out, can you believe this? Have you been suffering from something so long to where you've been convinced by the pain, the suffering that you've experienced, that God can't deal with it, or that he can't deliver it, or that he can't heal? Is his arm become so short that he cannot resolve the problems that you're going through? You see, I'm convinced in my own life And I can't speak for you because only you can assess you. But I know for me the depth of unbelief that has been in my heart and the depth of unbelief that has been in my heart has been hidden by the facade of belief. I have worried even though I've seen time and time and time and time and time and time again, the Almighty come through for me. Don't know how we're going to get through this month, even though the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 months, he's come through over and over and over. Beginning of the month, the first week of the month, expecting certain things to happen on certain days and not coming, and only at the end of the month, seeing the Father come through again. So I shifted my cycle of worry. (laughs) Instead of worrying the first week, I'd wait till the second week. And then I shifted my cycle of worry to the third week. And then I shifted my cycle of worry to the fourth week of the month until he finally convinced me that worrying is not going to change what he does. So why do it? It took time and time and time and time and time again. Now, if you ask me if I believe he's going to come through, I will tell you unequivocally, yes, but secretly worry. Have you ever believed that 
he is capable and able and will, but worry that he won't. And then there's the issue as we talk about the report that we believe, the report that we believe is going to come out through the words that we speak because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Can you believe that he's going to heal you and deliver you and yet speak unbelief? Well, I know he can when he wants to. Well, what about right now? Well, I'm not going to put pressure on him. I'm not going to tell him how to do his job. I'm not going to tell him when to heal me. And as you listen to people speak, the Bible tells us very clearly out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so I've had to correct and and, and, and help people watch the words that they speak and even encourage us to watch the things that we're speaking when, well, let me put it this way, always being aware of the words that is coming out of your mouth. What are you saying? What are you saying? Are you speaking faith? Are you speaking doubt? Are you speaking double-minded? Are you saying on one side of your mouth you believe he is, but on the other side he's not going to do it? And then there are always those statements, well, you know, God is using this to teach me a lesson. Well, you know, he can teach you a lesson without putting sickness and disease on you. You know, he can just give you amnesia to where you forget about the fact that you may have a drug problem or you forget about the fact that you may have an alcohol problem and never touch the stuff again. You know, he can do, he, he can give you memory lapse. He can do all kinds of things. He don't have to put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. He don't have to put disease on you to teach you a lesson. That's not how he operates. The goodness of Jehovah is what leads, leads us to repentance. You see, he want to bless you to the point to where you say, you know, I'm a fool. I'm a fool for putting myself in a, sit- in, a, in a position to stop the flow of blessings from coming into my life. That's how he operates. He doesn't curse, he blesses. You see, he's not sending curses your way. He's sending blessings your way. He's sending angels your way. He's sending people across your path to to bring you good news, not bad news. He's, He's raising up individuals and saying, listen, beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. He's a good news bearer, not a bad news bearer. He's not heralding doom and gloom over your life. He's trying to get you to a point to be healed. As we read last week, it is the desire of Jehovah that all men be saved. And in that saved is his desire is that all men be made whole. The one who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy is not named Jehovah. That's not the one. He's not coming to destroy you. He's not coming to steal from you. He's not coming to to take from you. He sends his word to heal. He sends his word to deliver. He is a deliverer. He is a healer. He is the one who fight our battles. He is our strong tower. He is our protector. He is the one. He's the God of more than enough. He not only meet our need, but the Bible says he, 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 is, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or can even imagine. That's what he want to do. He want to heal you. He want to deliver you. He want to see you rejoicing. It's hard to rejoice when things aren't going well. It's hard to rejoice when you're broke. It's hard to rejoice when you're sick. It's hard to to rejoice when you, 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 you can't take care of yourself. And so the prophet says, who will believe our report? And I'm hoping that tonight 
that you will certainly believe that he is the healer and that he's here to heal you. Now, there's a couple of other things that I need to say. When we receive our healing, when we receive our deliverance, we have to be willing to stop living a sinful lifestyle. I've seen too many people receive deliverance. And, and I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I stopped ministering deliverance. I've seen people delivered. I've seen, I've seen demons leave people. Make noises when they depart. Some of you have heard me say I've seen people wither on the, on the floor like snakes. I've heard voices come out of people. I've had demons speak to me. I've had people go into states and, you know, the thing that is coming out of them, the sounds and the smells that are coming out of them, it's atrocious. I've seen some ugly, nasty stuff coming from people. And I know the power of the Almighty. When you walk in authority and you command something to leave, it has to go. But get this, it has the right to go through arid places and to come back and knock. It doesn't have the right to enter, but it has the right to come back to your house. And you have to stand guard. And this is where you now have to be willing to learn to incorporate in your life what is needed to maintain your deliverance, to maintain your healing. Yeshua put it like this in John chapter 4, John chapter 5, John chapter 5 in verse number 14, he says, and this is, this is after a fellow had been, had been healed. In verse number 14, it says, afterwards Yeshua finds him in the temple and said unto him, behold, thou art made whole. You've been healed of blindness. Now here's, here's the command. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. He says, you've been delivered. Everyone knows that you've been healed. You've, you were blind and now you can see. Now go and sin no more. Now, if you, if you read the story, the question was asked, who sinned? Was it the man who sinned? Was it his family who sinned? The man was born blind. And this, we know, Yeshua says to him, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And then there is the situation here in John chapter number 8. John chapter 8, there's a woman who had been caught in a relationship that was worthy of the death penalty. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, Yeshua is not giving this woman the, um, he's not in violation. There's some who say, well, you know, he's violating the Torah. I'm telling you, there are people who, who, who say this that this woman deserved the death penalty. Yeshua never said the woman did, didn't deserve death. Matter of fact, if you look at what he's saying here, the Bible tells us in verse number um, seven, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him be the first one to cast a stone at her. In other words, this woman is, is, is worthy of death. Now, stone her. Stone her until she's dead. But here's the stipulation. The first one of you who throw the stone must be one 
who is without sin. Stone her, but let the first one who is without sin throw the first stone. Or let the one who is without sin throw the first stone. And what is he saying? You, you, you have judged this woman, but remember that whatever means you judge will be judged. You will be judged. So she's worthy of death. Stone her. But the one without sin, you cast the first stone. And then the next one without sin, you cast the second stone. And then the third stone, on and on and on until she's dead. But here's what he says. Whoever is without sin, you be the first one to cast a stone. And what happens in verse number eight? And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, did he, did he ever say, let the woman go? No, he never did. And they which heard it being convicted by their own consciousness went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Yeshua was left alone. Now, you got to understand something. These, these individuals was trying to convict him. They were, they were looking for a reason to, to destroy him. So he didn't violate their law. He didn't violate the law. Otherwise, they would have had a good reason to condemn him because they were trying to trap him. But in his saying, they were convicted of, by their own consciousness from the oldest to the least. When Yeshua had lifted up his head again and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, no man, master. And Yeshua said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. And then what does he say? Go and sin no more. As I was saying, I've seen people get delivered. I've seen people get healed. And they go. And now that they've got this new freedom, for some reason or another, they find themselves doing things that give these same spirits that have been driven out access to come back in. You see, there has to be a sin no more mindset. I know that there are people who hinder their healing because they're not willing to allow forgiveness to release others who have wronged them. They're holding other people hostage. It's no different than the man who had been delivered of his debt, freed from his debt. He left immediately to go and find someone who owed him and began to mistreat someone who owed him less than what he had just been forgiven for. There are people who who receive forgiveness, but then won't forgive. And the Bible tells us that if you don't forgive those who have sinned against you, your heavenly father will not forgive you of your sin. You see, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. So as we have been forgiven, as his desire is for all of us to be saved, delivered, made whole, then our desire in our heart should be willing to let others who have wronged us go. And then finally, we have been given power to heal. I'll give you a couple of scriptures and then we're going to pray. And I encourage you, uh, those of you who are joining us. Shalom, saints. 
Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4, when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he with, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, said Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. During his earthly ministry, Yeshua taught his disciples that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the works he did, they would do, and even greater works would they do. The power of the Holy Spirit is made available to every true believer. In this powerful four DVD teaching, The Power of the Holy Spirit, author and teacher Arthur Bailey reveals the prerequisites all believers must meet to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power. And Yeshua says, has given you authority, all authority in heaven and earth. In this four DVD teaching, you will learn what is the power Yeshua spoke of? Is the power still available for the disciples of Yeshua today? How can the disciples of Yeshua operate in this power today? And so much more. Don't miss out on this powerful four DVD teaching. Call the number on your screen. Visit our website or write Arthur Bailey Ministry, P.O. Box 1182, Fort Mill, South Carolina, 29716. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. This program is made possible through financial contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.